Jesus, you are my strength. Because of you, I will run and not grow weary. With you, I know all things are possible. I will fight the good fight, and I will finish the race. Well, good morning and welcome to everyone here and those joining us online. It's so good to be together. My name is Zach Bush, and I have the joy of serving here as the multi-site pastor, the Bush Lake campus pastor, as well as jumping into the teaching team from time to time. And as you saw in our video, we are in the middle of our summer sermon series called Summer Games, Picking Up the Torch. It's all about a discipleship series. It's all about growing in our faith. Because whenever we look at the New Testament, whenever we look at our faith, There are often parallels drawn between uh, training for our faith and the Olympic athletes and how they train and they compete. Our faith is often described as running a race. It's not a short race, but it's a marathon race uh, that is laid out before us. And so this is just a fun series that we've been digging into in preparation, not only for how God has called us to grow in our faith, but also for the Summer Olympics that are just around the corner. And as I was preparing for this message today, I was reminded of some of my favorite Olympic memories. Uh, One came just a few years ago. I don't quite remember uh, what Olympic year it was, but I was watching the men's swimming races, and there was one. It was the 100-meter swim. Now, these guys were just lightning fast, okay? And so they lined up on the blocks, and they got ready to go, uh, and the, the gun went off, and they just dove into the water like torpedoes and just took off. And they were swimming ferociously. And then they came up to the turn, you know, the wall, uh, where they made that, that crazy turn. And, and, you know, I think to myself, like, if that's me in the water, all this water would go up my nose, right? Wouldn't be a good look at all for any of us. Uh, but they came off the wall. And there was one guy in particular who just shot off the wall. And he came up ferociously swimming, swimming, swimming. And he hit the wall, came out of the water, emerged, gold medal winner, excited and ecstatic. And then the banner went across the bottom of the screen, disqualified. And as they zoomed in on the replays, as they looked at the race that he just swam, they go, yep, there it is, an illegal kick. Now, I don't know what it was. I watched the replay uh, a ton of times. I'll be honest with you, if they ever had a doggy paddling race, I would probably meddle in that. (laughs) Okay, I'm not a certified swimmer at all, but I was looking, I was like, really? He he broke the rules? Like, what what, what is this all about? And he owned it. He he got out of the water. He's like, yep, I I should have been disqualified. And the reality was is that he broke the rules set before him. And as we think about rules, I mean, a lot of times we kind of rebel against rules, but rules are fairly important. Okay, rules, they really clarify for us what we can and can't do. They really level out the playing field. Rules really give us a guideline and a boundary for the competition that's before us. And similarly, we see that there are certain rules applied to our faith as well. In fact, the Apostle Paul uh, shares these words with Timothy. He, He says this, Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. And so we can see that there are rules that are a part of our faith that sometimes can define and clarify our faith. And so that's what I want to look at today. What are the rules of our faith? And maybe some of you are just wondering that question. You're like, okay, what what are the rules? What are the guidelines of our faith? Maybe some of you are sitting there and you're like, yeah, I know the rules of the faith, but I'm going to be honest, I don't really follow those rules all the time, okay? You can be honest with it. It's hard for me too a lot of times. But what are these rules? What are these guidelines? What are these boundaries that are set before us, that I believe that if followed, then we will have, as Jesus says, not just life, but life abundantly. And so to understand these rules, we're going to be digging into a couple of verses in the book of Titus. Now, some background for you. Uh, Titus was a guy who planted a church on the island of Crete in the Mediterranean Sea. And as he planted this church, his mentor and coach, Paul, wrote these letters back to Titus. And, and, and Crete wasn't necessarily the easiest place to plant a church, but as Paul's writing, he's really saying, here are the rules, here are the foundations, here are the guidelines for faith. I want you to accept them, and I want you to share them with others as well. 
So maybe here's an invitation for you. Titus is only about three chapters. Read it this week. If you don't have a Bible, we talked about this last week, but there are Bibles out at our info spot. And if you're like, how do I study the Bible or where do I start? We also have bookmarks for you. It shows you um, where, uh, where to start. It's got a QR code that leads you to some Bible uh, studying plans, but it also has how you can study God's Word with some directives there as well. Uh, but today I want to look specifically at one passage in Titus. It comes from Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. And to give you a little bit of a roadmap, as we think about Titus and how it relates to our rules, I got three key points for you today. We'll see, first of all, something to accept. Okay, a rule that we can accept. Second, we'll see a rule that we can align to, uh, something that we're called to align our life to. And then third, a way to adopt, a rule to adopt in our lives. Okay, so I want to invite you to pull out your teaching notes there. They're on the back side of that engagement card. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of ground today, but as we walk through Titus, I just want to invite you um, just really quickly. Each point, there's going to be an invitation for each and every one of us that I hope and pray will land with you wherever you find yourself at in your faith journey. Whether you're brand new to faith or you're kind of like, I'm still trying to figure out this whole faith thing, or if you've been walking with Jesus for quite some time, I invite you at the end of each little point or each rule, reflect and say, yep, I'm here or I'm there. And then what I want to invite you to do is we'll have a chance to respond at the very end. Okay, but let's go ahead and dive in and read this passage in its entirety. Let's read Titus 2 verses 11 and following. It says this, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good." Okay, so now this leads us into our first point, which as I mentioned before, it's this idea, what is a rule that we can accept? Uh, and so let's dig back, and I want us to stay close to the text today. Uh, let's look again at verse 11 to understand it says this, uh, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Okay, within this one little verse, there's a word that I hope is repeated, that if you've grown up in church or if you've been around Christians for any time, uh, you will hear this word repeated, and it's the word grace. Now, the hard part is I think we throw uh, some of these Christian words, this word like grace around and we don't fully comprehend the meaning of it. But whenever we look at this, at this verse in verse 11, uh, what Paul is saying is he's saying, uh, for the grace of God has appeared. You know, I think a lot of times we think of grace simply as a theory or, or as a, a concept in our minds. But what it's saying here is that the grace has appeared. Ultimately, at the end of the day, grace isn't just a theory, but grace is a person. It's the person of Jesus Christ. That's what we can see. And it says, for the grace of God has appeared. Almost like whenever you're up early in the morning and you see the sun appearing. Much like whenever it's nighttime and you see the stars appearing in the sky. It's becoming real to us. It's almost like I can see it, I can reach out, I can touch it. That's what Paul is getting at. He's saying, for the grace of God has appeared. It's real for you and for me. It's real in the person of Jesus Christ. And so then what is grace exactly? Well, we would say a simple definition, grace is unmerited favor. Okay, it's unmerited favor shown to us from Jesus. Unmerited in the sense of we can't earn it, we can't uh, buy it, we can't achieve for it. It's something that is freely given to you and to me. And it's favor, something bestowed upon us. So then you're probably thinking, okay, within that one little definition there, unmerited favor, that means if that's what I'm receiving from God through Jesus... Am I in God's favor now? Uh, like, what is my standing before God? Uh, much like we talked about the Olympic swimmer who was disqualified because he broke the rules, we too have to ask the question, what is our standing before God and our faith? Do you want to know that question, the answer to that question? What is your standing? You ready for it? We're all disqualified from birth. All right, there's the message. Good work, team. Let's close in prayer. Have a great day. I'm kidding. No, it says... Grace has appeared. There's something different. But the fact that we are all disqualified is something true. And this is what we call the doctrine of original sin, that we are sinful even from birth. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're like, I've got a newborn. I've got a kid at home. I've got a grandkid. They are darn near perfect. 
Okay, what is original sin then? Oh, okay, here's what sin is. It's this pervasiveness that we can't avoid that will ultimately draw our emotions, our desires inward. It'll push us towards selfishness to look after me, myself, and I. It's my wants, my desires, my longings, and life. And we're born with this from birth, and it disqualifies us. I mean, think about it. What are the first words uttered from a toddler? Usually it's mom, dad, in our household, snack. <laughs> but then another word, mine. They say mine, All right? You can begin to see it's, it's, it's internally focused. It's, it's what I want, what I long for, what I desire. Okay, I don't want to throw too much shade at the kids, but here's the thing. <laughs> You're like, you already did that. Way to go, Zach. <laughs> kids should be loved. They should be cherished. That's why we do child dedication, so that we can pray for these little ones, that they'll know the love of Jesus Christ. So let's use another example. Let me just ask you, do you have a lock on your home or your car? Okay, last time I checked, we all have locks on our houses. Okay, we're intuitively saying there is something wrong with this world that we need to be aware of. Whenever you have locks on your car or on your house, you're supposing that there is something broken, that the world is not functioning the way that it's supposed to function. That's because of sin. And because of sin, because we're born with it from the beginning, the standing that we have is disqualified. So I want you to just imagine, okay, in the Olympic example or in a legal sense, as you stand before the Olympic committee or if you stand before a, a judge, they're looking down upon you and because of sin, we are now declared guilty or we are now declared disqualified. And so what do we do with this then? Okay, what do we do with this, this ruling that's before us? Well, the thing about it is that other worldviews or other faiths will say, you know what, you gotta earn your way, you gotta work your way back into good graces. But there's something completely different about Christianity. You see, whenever we see that Jesus has appeared, the grace of God has appeared, we fall under the rule of grace. And so the first point that I want us to draw our attention to is this. In the rule of faith, we are called to accept God's grace. First point, plain and simple. In the rule of faith, we are called to accept God's grace. We're called to accept and receive with open hands God's unmerited favor to you and to me, that, that the grace of God has appeared offering salvation to all. And so then the question is, okay, uh, if we're called to accept God's grace, if we're called to accept his favor, is there a way that grace can change our standing? Is there a way that grace can change us from being disqualified to now qualified, from being declared guilty to not guilty? And the answer, absolutely. Yes, grace can do that. And so what I want to do is I want to lay out for you a couple of theological words under each and every point that really, in my opinion, uh, set out the rules and the guidelines of our faith, kind of the direction that Christ has laid out for us. And the first word that I want to give to you is the word justification. Here's what justification is. Justification is the freedom from the penalty of sin. Okay, justification is the freedom from the penalty of sin. Here's what happens. We are declared guilty, but what Jesus does, it says the word became flesh, the, the, the grace of God has appeared, and Jesus steps into our world, and he does what theologians call the great exchange, where he takes our sin, our unrighteousness, and he exchanges that, and he gives us his righteousness and his perfection. And then we can stand before the judge, not seeing our old selves, but now seeing the righteousness of Christ. That's how we are then justified, free from the penalty of sin, that we are declared guilty. Now, I want you to really kind of uh, allow this to, to sit in your mind. And so I want to illustrate this. I've got my friend Jacob. Jacob, why don't you come on down? I've got Jacob. Uh, he's going to help me illustrate this for a brief moment. And as you can see on the, the stage here, there are some jean jackets. Okay, we're not doing a fashion show up here just so you're aware. But Jacob, why don't you go ahead and grab your jean jacket? I'll grab mine. So that each jean jacket holds uh, something, uh, holds significance for something else. Now here's the existential question. Would Jesus have rocked a, de a jean jacket if he was here today? <laughs> Who knows? We're not going to answer that. I don't know. That's pretty deep. <laughs> That's very deep. Okay, so as you can see, Jacob, I've got a, a role for you to play, okay? The role I want you to play, I want you to play the role of Jesus, okay? No pressure. <laughs> no pressure at all. Okay, but what you can see in, in Jacob is he's donning this, this white jacket. And white in the New Testament is symbolic of purity and perfection and righteousness. And so Jacob has that. Uh, in John 1, it says, Behold the perfect spotless Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. So Jacob, you got the Jesus role. 
Now, I've got my own jean jacket on. I'm going to play the important role of, and I was cast perfectly for this one, the sinner. <laughs> All right, many of you are like, amen, yeah, stay there. Now, but here's why I'm wearing this, because this is what's called distressed denim. All right, you can see it, because sin, right, it's holy. Whenever we have sinfulness in our lives, we're broken, we're frayed, we're fragmented, all of those sort of things. But what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, this is where he talks about the great exchange. He says this, he made him, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, perfection and purity. He made him who knew no sin to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so here's how this works. Jesus steps into our broken, sinful, fallen world. And he comes to us and and he actually removes from us. Jacob, go ahead and remove that. He removes our sinful, fallen nature. We can't do it ourselves. We can't clean ourselves up. This is only something that Jesus can do himself. And then Jesus steps in and removes his righteousness and now places his righteousness upon you and me whenever we put our faith and our trust in him. And so now all of a sudden, this is called imputed righteousness, that his righteousness is put on us. Now here's your role, okay? You get to play the role of the judge. So what do you see in me right now? You see Jesus' righteousness and perfection. Where I once was disqualified and declared guilty, now Jesus living a perfect spotless life given to me, I am now called qualified. I am now declared not guilty. I am now a new creation in Christ. That's what God's grace does for us. But I know what you're thinking. You're thinking to yourself, okay, but what about your frayed, holy denim jacket? Okay, God is still a holy God. Uh, And so what Jesus actually does, it says, you know, he made him who knew no sin to be sin. For the wages of sin is death. And so Jesus gives us his righteousness and takes our sin upon himself. And the wages of sin is death. He goes to the cross. You realize this, right? That death was reserved for you and me because of sin. But Jesus died in our place. And in dying in our place, he now gives us new life. So that we can go freely. So that we are no longer disqualified. That we are no longer guilty. But now we are qualified in Christ. And we are innocent in his name. Friends, let this sit in your mind. Let this reverberate in your heart. May this swell up joy and gratitude for what Jesus has done for each and every one of us when we put our faith in him. Jacob, you've been great. Let's give it up for Jacob. Thanks, brother. So I hope you see that. I hope you see this idea of justification, that we are free from the penalty of sin, that we are now no longer disqualified, but now we are qualified. So I just want to ask you this question. Do you resonate with this point? Okay, have you ever truly accepted God's grace in your life? Have you trusted him to follow him for what he's done on our behalf, to give us his righteousness? Think about that and make a note. Well, that's the first point, that idea of accepting. But now we come to the second point, which deals with aligning our lives. And one of the things that I appreciate about this passage is it says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all. But then it says, and it teaches us. And so grace is so important because it not only saves us one and done, but grace also sustains us in this journey as well. Let's go back to verse 12 and see how grace sustains us. It says this, It, being grace, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Okay, so when we look at this verse here, There's almost this rhythmic pattern that we can see established uh, to where it says the grace of God teaches us to say no to some things and yes to other things. No to worldly passions and yes to upright, self-controlled, godly lives. And so it's calling us to align our lives in some capacity. And so I want to just speak briefly to this idea. Okay, what are worldly passions and what is this ungodliness that it's talking about? Why should I be saying no to those things? Well, worldly passions Uh, It has this idea of worldly being uh, contrary and antagony towards God and passions being something that is a strong yearning or a strong desire. It's because of sin that it's uh, pushing us inwards to focus on me, myself, and I. And worldly passions, I mean, it's all around us. In fact, if I'm honest, I had one recently where I fell uh, into worldly passions. Now, here's what happened a few weeks back. I was driving from the office over at Bush Lake out to Mount West Tonka. We're launching a new campus in Mount West Tonka and this next school year, we're so excited about it. And we were holding an info meeting out there. 
And as I jumped in the car, I was driving out, and I realized I didn't have dinner. But then I remembered that my good friend, Pastor Dave Troutman, the man, the myth, the legend, had just returned from a trip to Texas. And every time Dave goes to Texas to see his family, he brings back some goodies for me to remind me of my home country. I mean, my homeland, my home state. (laughs) It's not in the script, I promise. And so Dave always stops at this store called Bucky's. Okay, yes, yes. The one person, no one else knows what Bucky's is, but you do. Okay, what is Bucky's for everyone else? Okay, Bucky's, it's kind of like Fleet Farm mixed with the Minnetonka Country Store, mixed with Costco, uh, mixed with a, a gas station and a little slice of heaven. Okay, I may have just overhyped it. Did I overhype it? Nah. Beef jerky's there too, but they carry their own line of goodies and such. And one of the things that Bucky's has that Dave always brings back for me is a little thing called beaver nuggets. Now what are, <laughs> I know it sounds terrible, okay? Bear with me, hold on. What, what are beaver nuggets? <laughs> Should have thought this through. <laughs> beaver nuggets are just sweet little puffs wrapped and dipped in caramel, okay? The mascot for Bucky's is a beaver, folks. Come on, hang with me now. And so I'm sitting there and I realize that there are some beaver nuggets unopened sitting in my car and I'm driving out there and I'm like, I'm hungry. So I did what any good person would do. I cracked open that bag, I put it in my cup holder and I began to eat said beaver nuggets. I had one, two, three, and I was on 494. I got around to 62, that interchange there. And I realized, I'm like, oh my goodness, I've just been eating this candy this whole time. I should probably stop. Do you think I stopped? (laughs) Absolutely not. I kept eating until after about eight minutes, I realized what I had done. Uh, This is what the bag looked like when I was done. I ate half the bag of beaver nuggets. There's Bucky right there. Don't let him fool you. He will trick you into eating all the candy and all the snacks. But after I ate half the bag of the beaver nuggets, I finally wrapped it up and I threw it away and I said, I can't do any more. But guess what happened after about five, 10 minutes? My body was craving sugar and was craving sweets. And so as we think about worldly passions, bring it all the way back, all right? When we think about worldly passions, it's giving into those cravings. But here's the truth of it. Your body craves and longs for what you feed it. Okay, think about that for a moment. Your body craves and longs for what you feed. And so it's just a question for you. As you think about this idea of saying no to worldly passions and saying yes to godliness, are you finding your nourishment on things that are apart from God? Are you finding nourishment on the things that are detrimental to you? Or are you saying yes and finding your nourishment in things of Christ? Because at the end of the day, it's, it's not just saying no to these things in a vacuum, but it's ultimately saying yes to these other things that are life-giving. It's not just saying I'm getting less of this. It's ultimately saying I'm getting more of Jesus. And so if we were to put words around this second point of what it means to align our lives, we would ultimately say it's this. In the rule of faith, we are called to align our lifestyle to Christ. Okay, a second point is this. In the rule of faith, we are called to align our lifestyles to the rule of, or to the lifestyle of Christ. To say no to some things and to say yes to life-giving things. To say no to the beaver nuggets and to say yes to things that are far more healthy and nourishing for us. And so as I mentioned before, there are certain theological words that I'm going to give to you throughout this time. The first word was justification. It's the freedom from the penalty of sin that we're no longer declared disqualified. The second word that I'm going to give to you is the word sanctification. And sanctification is the freedom from the power of sin. Okay, it's the freedom from the power of sin. Now here's the thing, sanctification, it comes from the Latin word sanctus, which means to be set apart, to be holy. And when we think about this, uh, we're called to be and live like Jesus, that our lives are supposed to follow in this rhythmic pattern, to move away from the things that are of this world and to pursue things of what Christ has laid out before us, to be formed more fully into his image. And here's how it relates to justification. Justification is a one and done sort of thing that we are declared instantaneously that we are free. But now sanctification is an ongoing process. Uh, We might say it's the word progressive sanctification, that we are progressively being formed into the image of Christ as we say no to those things that are unhealthy and detrimental and say yes to the things that are life-giving. 
to things like the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so I want to invite you to reflect. Do you find yourself in this camp where you're just sitting there and you're like, man, alive, I've got this one thing that's kind of a a hitch in me. I've got this burden that I just can't quite seem to say no to. The reality is that when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, he gives us the Holy Spirit. And the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that's alive and well in you and me for those who have put trust in Christ. And he gives us the power to say no to those things and say yes to godliness. That's what it looks like. Grace not only saves us, but grace sustains us. And we've seen, first of all, that we're called to accept God's grace. Second, align our lifestyles to Christ. But now we come to this third point, which deals with acceptance, accepting something. And I know what you might be thinking. You're like, yeah, I'm in that sanctification phase, but it's so hard and it's so difficult. Well, let's dig into that a little bit more. Let's look back at verse 13. It says this, It says, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Okay, when we think about this, Paul opens up and he says, while we eagerly wait, and other translations it'll say, while we look forward, And what are we looking forward to? It's a futuristic leaning. It says, while we eagerly wait for the appearing of our blessed hope. That word appearing is repeated. Guess where it appeared the first time? In verse 11, it says the grace of God has appeared. Jesus came once, and then it says that Jesus will also appear a second time, and that he will come back to make all things new and all things right. And so we're living here in this gap between Jesus' rule and his reign. But as we think about this idea of eagerly waiting, it gives us something to apply to our lives. It gives us something to adopt. And that is, where do we put our focus and our attention? And so our third point is we think about adopting a new posture. It's this, in the rule of faith, we are called to adopt hope. Okay, in the rule of faith, we are called to adopt hope. In verse 13, it says that uh, Jesus, he's going to appear again, and he's going to redeem us from all wickedness and lawlessness And that word redeem has this idea of buying back, uh, to to purchase back. And Jesus is using the currency, which is his own precious blood, as we saw right here, stepping into our world. And he's going to buy us back from the family of darkness into the family of light. And it gives us this new identity. As we sang just a little bit ago that we are a child of love and Jesus' work and putting faith in him. But the reality is that he says he's going to redeem us from all wickedness and lawlessness. And so as we wait in between his first appearance and his second appearance, we know that there's a little bit of a tension that we live in, that sin is still present. And so some of you might be like, yeah, I get it. Every single day, it's so hard and it's so difficult. But here's why adopting hope is so important. This leads us to our third theological word for the day, and it's the word glorification. And glorification is this. Glorification is the freedom from the presence of sin. Whereas justification is the freedom from the penalty of sin, sanctification is the freedom from the power of sin, now glorification is the freedom from the presence of sin. Think about it for just a moment. That we, on this side of eternity, at Jesus' second coming, there will be a time in which we are free, not only from sin, but from the effects and the causes of sin. Just think about it, there's going to be no more death, disability, decaying, there will be no conflict, no more hardships. Just simply put, we're going to be with Christ in perfect peace. And so I just want to ask you, have you ever watched a movie or read a book where you know the ending? Okay, you know all the plots and the twists and the turns. Okay, I don't want to ruin it for you, but this is the truth of our faith. That we know the ending. We know how it's going to go. We know that Jesus is going to come back and he's going to be victorious. He's going to stand as champion over all and he's going to come back and he's going to redeem us from all lawlessness. And as we think about that word redeem... He's going to give us a new identity. He's going to give us a new identity that we can define ourselves by. And so if you find yourself here, I just want to ask you, how do you identify yourself in faith right now? Okay, how do you identify? What goes through your mind whenever you think about yourself in faith? I'll give you two options. Do you see yourself as a saint who sometimes sins? Or do you find yourself as a sinner who sometimes does saintly things? Answer that question personally. Would you identify yourself as a sinner who sometimes, as, I'm sorry, as a saint who sometimes sins, 
or as a sinner who sometimes does saintly things. How do you identify yourself? You see, because I think if we're over here in this camp, we're sitting there and we're thinking to ourselves, you know what? Man, I blew it again. I I just can't seem to get it right. This broken record continues to swirl. How could God love me? How could God use me for his kingdom purposes? I'm no good. I'm completely, utterly worthless. You see, whenever we find ourselves in this camp, I think that we get so bogged down by shame and guilt. But can we be honest for a second? Okay, shame is a ploy used by Satan to drive a wedge in our relationship with God. I mean, just think about it. What was the first thing that Adam and Eve did in the garden after they disobeyed God? They ran and hid out of shame. And so this is why it's so important to adopt hope, to have a futuristic idea that whenever things get hard, whenever things get difficult, we can remember that we are in Christ saints. We are his priesthood, that we are called to something greater, that we're not just saved from something, but we're saved to something to bring his hope and his goodness in this world. And though we might not always get it right, that's our identity, that we are sons and daughters, that we are the priesthood of Christ. And so here's a little axiom. That a lot of times whenever I find myself in this funk where I'm like, you know what, I just feel shame heaping itself up upon me. And it's this, when Satan reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. Yeah, come on, you can amen that, you can applaud that. When Satan reminds you of your past, the, the shame, the guilt that you feel, just remind him of his future. Okay, what is his future? We know the ending. We know that Jesus stands on the podium with the gold medal as the ultimate champion, the victor, the one who stands and saying, it is finished. The one who uh, really ransomed and redeemed all of us to bring his perfect peace into this world and to do away with sin and brokenness. And we can fix our eyes and we can have a, a posture eagerly waiting the appearing of our blessed hope. And so friends, are you in this camp? Do you find yourself bogged down by shame and guilt every single day? Here's the thing. Grace doesn't just save us, but it sustains us. And grace overpowers guilt. And so adopt hope in your life. Adopt hope for what Christ has done. And so friends, as we wrap it up, I just want to invite you, like I mentioned before, think about it, reflect on it. Where do you find yourself in this faith journey? The first, second, or third camp? I want to start with the second one. Okay, do you find yourself kind of in this place where you're like, yeah, you know, I need to align my life to Christ. I I need to find a way to uh, just move towards him. I I need the sanctifying work to be done. I need to say no to certain things. Maybe even identify what that thing is that's detrimental to you so that you can say yes to godliness. Or do you find yourself in this third camp? Do you find yourself constantly weighed down and bogged down by shame and guilt? Maybe for you it means adopt hope. Continue to eagerly lean towards and look to the futuristic hope that we have in Christ and his second coming and his appearance. But I also know full well that there are some here today and watching online that you have never accepted God's grace. You've never known what it's like to have the justifying work of Jesus as he's given us his righteousness and taken our brokenness and our sinfulness away from us so that we can stand before the judgment seat declared not guilty. If that's you, friends, I want to invite you, even today, as a chance to respond to Christ. And just say, simply put, with open hands, I want to accept God's grace. I want to receive his goodness and his love. And so friends, wherever you find yourself today, may we run this race with the rules, with the directives, with those things laid out before us for our good and ultimately for God's glory. Would you please stand with us as we pray? Gracious Father, we thank you so much that you are with us in all things, that you guide and direct our steps, that you clarify for us the directions that you have in our lives. And God, I know that there are some here who have just, maybe this is brand new for them to to hear of your good news, your grace, your gospel, maybe even for the first time, or maybe they haven't understood it in this way before. And so I just pray, Lord, that you will do a work, that they will have attentive ears and softened heart to know you. And so friends, if you've never accepted Christ, I want to invite you to prayerfully, quietly, reflectively pray with me here now. All it takes is this. First of all, it's God, I admit that I am broken, that I am fallen, that I am sinful, that apart from you, I have no hope. And after we admit the sinfulness that we have, we we can believe We can believe in him, believe he is who he says that he is, that he is fully God and fully human, that he came to take away our sin 
our unrighteousness to give us his righteousness. So in your heart and your mind, just pray. Say, Jesus, I believe. Thank you for who you are and what you've done. And then it means to just simply put, commit, and confess. Confess, Jesus, I confess you as Lord. I confess you as Savior. I remove the hands from the steering wheel of my life, and I invite you to give me the directives before me. I commit to following you. You've you've saved me from the wages of sin. You've given me new life. And so I want to follow you now as the good, loving, gracious King. And Lord, we know that for the rest of us here, there are just so many things that you lay before us to be formed more fully into your image, to to walk in the ways that you have called us to, that you haven't just saved us from something, but you've saved us to something. You've given us purpose and identity. Your grace not only saves, but it sustains us. So in this day, in this week, in this month, may we reflect and remember your grace and may that swell our hearts for generosity and, and gratitude. May we remember the future hope that we have, that you stand victorious. May we fix our eyes upon you. And God, we pray all this in the beautiful, matchless name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.